Welcome to my channel. I'm really thankful to have you here. I'm grateful for every single one of you that watches my videos, even the handful that watch these. This is today's episode of the Daily News Clips. The first item that I have in the news today is an interesting article by Niall Ferguson entitled The Democratic Party Will Waits Its Gorbachev. If you don't know who Niall Ferguson is, he's an academic who, I guess you could call him a contrarian because he's not like most academics. He's not a Marxist. Uh, he actually believes in the American experiment. And he's one of the founders of the University of Austin, a new university that's uh, beginning its first semester this fall in the hope that they can return universities to the their original purpose which was to educate young young people and this article well Niall is one of those people that has the ability to describe things in terms that make sense that you say yeah he's right and I've always thought that I just didn't know how to put it well Niall knows how to put it and so I've highlighted quite a bit this is a lengthy article as you can see and I've highlighted quite a bit of it because I think it's important the first part reads the most impressive feature of Thursday's debate between Brezhnev and Andropov, sorry, Trump and Biden, is that anyone watching was in the least surprised by what it revealed. The president is senile. The former president is a blowhard. Both these truths have been obvious for years. Yet somehow the New York Times editorial board and the hosts of Pod Save America and numerous other eminent liberal authorities were shocked by what CNN broadcast from Atlanta. Well, I don't know if they were shocked or they were just acting like they were shocked. I think everyone knew the truth, they just didn't want to admit it. But let's read on. Last year we saw another striking example of an unknown known. After the pogrom carried out by Hamas against Israel on October 7, 2023, Elite university campuses erupted with protests that in many cases were pro-Hamas or overtly anti-Semitic. Some of the world's most brilliant investors were shocked to discover that the elite colleges they have been supporting with their hundreds of millions of dollars have enrolled or employed a substantial number of leftists whose progressive views include variants of anti-Semitism. But this has been clear to anyone who bothered to visit the Harvard or Yale campus over the last decade. Yeah, it's obvious to anyone who pays any attention at all. So why is it such a shock to them is the question. The question is, are we dealing here with genuine myopia? Or are the people professing to be shocked by Harvard anti-Semitism or Biden's senility more like Captain Renault in Casablanca who professes to be shocked, shocked that people are gambling at Rick's nightclub even as he pockets his winnings. The answer is that they are much closer to Captain Renault than they would claim, care to admit to themselves, because like him, they belong to a thoroughly corrupt political system. People love to ask, are these really the best candidates we can come up with? What they mean is, why has the American political system provided voters with this terrible choice between two embarrassing old men for the post of president? I could not have put that any better. There are five structural reasons for American political senescence. First, more than at any time in our history, high elected office is deeply unattractive as an occupation for a talented young person. This was also true in the Soviet Union, where trying to secure an immigration visa was a better use of such a person's time. Today, founding and running a technology company is a thousand times more remunerative and one thousandth as irksome. Absolutely correct. He goes on to read, to, to give the, the other four points that he wants to make and talks about the elites and how they 
really are the ones who decide what happens in the parties. And he, he closes with this. It is a hallmark of decadent political systems that power becomes concentrated in the hands of a small and senescent oligarchy. So it is with the Democratic Party as it was with the Soviet Communist Party. True, the donorcrats are much wealthier than the Soviet nomenclatura, but the difference between a Hamptons mansion and a Zhukovkiv Dhaka is just one of price. Their functions are identical, to insulate the elite from the discomforts of ordinary mortals' lives. But there comes a moment in the lives of such elites when they realize that the jig is up. In the Soviet Union, that movement led to the appointment of Michael Mikhail Gorbachev and the slow unraveling of the rotten system as his reforms turned into outright dissolution. The Democratic Party awaits its Gorbachev. With 50 days until the DNC, the Democrats have few good options, but it is wrong to think they have none. They are nothing if not ruthless. When it was clear that Claudine Gay, exposed as a plagiarist as well as an appeaser of the anti-Zionists, had to go, Penny Pritzker did what had to be done and made that oh-so-painful call. And then finally this. Meanwhile, America's foreign adversaries are ordering more popcorn. <sighs> what a dreadful thought. Political degeneration always has geopolitical consequences, just as the descent through Brezhnev, Andropov, and Chernenko emboldened Ronald Reagan's administration to think that victory over the evil empire might just be attainable. So the leaders of the axis of ill will, which unites China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, must be watching our ger gerontocratic election with glee. <sighs> I'll put the link in the description and you can read the whole article. I've read a good bit of it to you. Not all of it, of course, but a good bit of it. But I just thought it was important to put that in front of you because he makes so many good points. It's, it's like, why was anyone surprised by what happened at the debate? Why was anyone? I mean, Biden's been doing this for four years, right? You've, you've seen the gaps over and over again. My next article is Hawk to a Girl is as Repulsive and Problematic as Pride Parades. This is an interesting article because it calls out Americans, heterosexuals, and nails them for what they really are. The only way to defeat the insanity and perversion of LGBTQIA plus Pride Month is by defeating the insanity and perversion of heterosexual pride year. The uncomfortable truth is that pride parades and drag shows are a mirror for the typical red-blooded American heterosexual. We celebrate, center, and flaunt our sexuality and just and lust 365 days a year. They have pride month, we have pride year. The behavior of the alphabet mafia is far more normal than many of us would like to admit. This mindset has been normalized through heterosexual America. We center our sexual lust everywhere. You can't watch a movie or a TV show without a gratuitous or pointless sex scene. Music is filled with sexual lust. We should not feign surprise that homosexuals use Pride Month as an excuse to flaunt their sexual behavior. We flaunt ours every chance we get. We normalized a pornographer, Hugh Hefner. We normalized Snoop Dogg and every other pornographic rapper. And it goes on. This is Jason Whitlock. I don't care much for him, but I think in this case, in this article, he's absolutely right. You know, Decency in America is laughed at now. It's pretty much gone. And for my final article, I'll have this. Democrats rage at Supreme Court for Trump immunity ruling, a travesty. If you're not aware of this, the Supreme Court just ruled yesterday 
that a president is immune from prosecution for his official acts. Not for his unofficial acts, but for his official acts. You know, if you understand anything about our system of government, you've known this was true all along. That's the reason why we have impeachment. Impeachment is how you get rid of a president who's misbehaving. But <laughs> Capitol Hill Democrats are hammering the Supreme Court on Monday over its decision to grant immunity president to presidents for official acts, saying it will empower future commander-in-chief to break the law with impunity. This decision by the Supreme Court today is a travesty and perhaps the most dangerous judicial opinion, and listen to this hyperbole, from our Supreme Court in generations, Representative Bill Pascrell, Democrat of New Jersey, said, By smooth and naive legalese, these partisan justices have created a framework for a president to commit any acts he or she chooses. This opinion is nothing less than a blueprint for a lawless dictator to take root in the Oval Office of the White House. No, it's not. All you have to do is is <laughs> all you have to do is just look at history. Look at Richard Nixon. What did Richard Nixon do? He authorized the break in of the Democratic National Headquarters, campaign headquarters, to get information that he felt he needed in order to win the election. And then he covered up the break in. And had he not resigned, he would have been impeached. Because when a president does something that's just completely out of bounds, completely off the rails, even his own party isn't going to support him. There will be enough people with enough common sense and enough wisdom to realize that the best thing to do is to get rid of this president. And they will impeach him and he'll be convicted in the Senate and thrown out of office. That's the remedy that our founding fathers provided for us for a president that, according to this, uh, is a lawless dictator. Well, if a president really is a lawless dictator, they're going to throw him out. That's the, that's the system of government that we have. That's how it was designed. If you allow presidents to be charged with crimes while they're in office, you open the door wide open for anybody who, who doesn't like the president, like an Alvin Bragg in New York, to file a criminal case against them and force them to go to court and be tried while they're president. That's, that's insanity. Here's another one. This ruling is perhaps the final nail in the coffin of this rogue Supreme Court's claim to institutional legitimacy, Goldman said. Pot kettle. The Supreme Court placed itself on trial with this decision, and its credibility has been further diminished in the eyes of all those who believe in the rule of law, said Nancy Pelosi. No, in my eyes, the Supreme Court, Supreme Court has been elevated. Now, the three justices who argued against this, those, I think, have embarrassed the court because they don't even understand the Constitution. And if you don't understand the Constitution, why are you on the Supreme Court? That is your job. You're supposed to be supporting the Constitution. The constitutional remedy for a rogue president is impeachment, period. Not, it doesn't make him above the law. It makes him subject to the political whims of the, the, uh, the, the, the legislative branch. And yeah, it's a hard remedy to take, but it's a hard remedy to take on purpose because you don't take lightly throwing a president out of office. But some of the scenarios... That, for example, Sonia Sotomayor, a Supreme Court justice, made were ridiculous. She said that the president could now order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate one of his political rivals. Um, no, no, he could not. First of all, the military is not going to do that. 
because that's a violation of their oath, which is to the Constitution. And secondly, if he managed to get away with that, if he actually managed to get away with that, he'd be thrown out of office. Plain and simple, he would be impeached and thrown out of office. It's ridiculous. But that's that's the world we live in. You know, I think it's and another thing that comes to mind for me. It's disgusting to me. Disgusting. That members of the legislative branch are deliberately undermining the judicial branch. Shame on them. Shame on every single one of them. They should be thrown out of office themselves. Oh, how I long for us to have legislators and jurists and executive branch people who actually know and understand and follow the Constitution. Just as I did when I swore an oath to defend our nation as a member of the military. I knew what I was swearing. Do you? Seems like many of you don't have a clue. Or you have a clue, which is even scarier, because then you're serving under a lie. You took an oath to defend the Constitution, and you're trying to undermine it. So you're serving under a lie. You lied when you took the oath. That's my opinion. Now, one last thing before I go. I have to show you my shirt. Yeah. Yeah. I've often said, and I've said on my channel, the best kind of humor is self-deprecating humor. So, I have a lot of shirts like that that make fun of the fact that I'm old. Hey, I'm old, okay? I forget things. I don't move as fast as I used to. It's harder for me to get up off the floor. It's all a consequence of getting old. Just the way it is. You have to learn to live with it. It beats the alternative. So, the last thing I want to do in this episode is pray for you. I pray that God will reach into your heart and touch you in a profound way and that your life will be changed forever because of it. I pray for that same thing for every person that you love. This is the Vietnam Era Vet, out. <laughs>